Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how a threat safety is fundamentally changing on a core level in .NET 9. Now, we've been using the lock approach in C Sharp for years and if you're not familiar with locking in C Sharp, I'm going to show you what that is in this video. But in .NET 9, finally Microsoft is addressing some of the biggest drawbacks of using the typical lock pattern in C Sharp. So let me show you what I have here. I have a .NET console application and I'm going to quickly show you what the problem with locking is and why we need it in C Sharp. So I'm going to go to this example class over here. Now I have a sum property over here with a private setter and a public getter. And then I have this add method where I'm adding a number into the existing sum. So I'm going to go to the program.cs and I'm going to say var example equals new example class over here. And then I'm going to say parallel dot for and the parallel class will use multi-threading to do an operation. So I'm going to say from inclusive zero to exclusive, uh, let's say 50. Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to take that uh, class and call the add method, but add the I. So it's basically a loop, but uh, parallelized. And in the end, I want to print, I want to write line what that sum is. Because remember, the add method is just adding the number I'm inputting into that sum. So if... I turn this into release mode and I say just run this and I'm doing this because threat safety works differently in release and debug. Uh, what you see is I'm getting one, but how am I getting one if I'm adding from zero all the way to 50 or 49 because 50 is exclusive. And if I run it again, you see 11 this time. Well, the, the 11, how does that even make sense? And then four and then I can keep going. So. That is the multi-threading issue because many threads are coming into that add method at the same time. And because it's not synchronized, it's not thread safe in any way, we're dropping some of those writes, some of those operations and sort of they're stepping onto each other. So the very common approach to deal with this issue is to do the following. You can go ahead and say private static read only because you don't want to reallocate it every time. Object, so you have some form of object, a managed type, as you can see over here, reference type actually. And I'm going to say a uh, padlock. Uh, you might have seen it like this or my lock or just M lock. But I have some form of a, a lock uh, object. And that object is going to be used in conjunction with the lock keyword. So I'm going to have a lock statement. Use that object, that reference type in the lock statement. And then I'm going to add that operation in here. And what that does is now if I say go ahead and run this, I'm going to have thread safety on this operation and every time I'm running it I'm going to get the exact same result. Now of course the drawback of doing something like this is I'm synchronizing the operation meaning that I'm sort of killing the point of multi-threading because now even though it's multi-threaded each thread has to wait for the lock to be uh, given up before it can get in. But that's besides the point I just want to showcase how locking is changing. So that's what locking with a padlock object is and on a fundamental level if we take a look at the IL the intermediate language code which is what C sharp is translating into so if we take a look into basically the low level C sharp what you're going to see is that the log operation is just translated into a, an object over here that we give a reference to we have a boolean called log taken and then we have the monitor class where we say enter so we have a try finally block we say enter in here with this uh, lock and then do the operation and then finally give up on that operation. So lock works sort of like the using keyword where it converts the using keyword into a, a try finally block. It's just syntactic sugar and it's wrapping it with the monitor enter and exit. Now this works great, but the lock keyword historically, first it has to be used with this sort of arbitrary object type which doesn't really have any reason to be an object it just needs to be a reference type and by the way for reference no pun intended if i try to use some this doesn't work the locked item needs to be a reference type so we have to use some sort of padlock and the idea is you use this single object because you basically want it to be something that nothing else will use because using it in other places as well for other reasons even though it could be any reference type i can have other drawbacks so now that's how we do it until c sharp 9 however from c sharp 9 onwards this is not how we're going to be doing locking because we're getting a new type dedicated 
forward-looking. But before I move on, I'd like to let you know that we're releasing a series of designed pattern courses on Dome Train, and we just released the first course on the Singleton pattern. It's completely free to get. Just use the link in the description, sign up, and it's yours to keep for free forever. We're planning to release a course on every design pattern, so stay tuned for that. Now back to the video. But the object we got in C Sharp 9 is actually called lock. So now we can have a lock object and we are supposed to use this lock object for locking and only this lock object. The instruction is that moving forward dot nine, the way to do locking and thread safety is this. It is not just any reference type. You should only be using a lock object in the lock. And something very interesting is happening. First, I'm just going to showcase that it still works the exact same way. So we're still getting the exact same result. But two things. First, you should know this will be more performant. Now, the problem with performance testing something like this is that it's extremely tricky to make a reliable benchmark for this. So what I'm going to do is just leave it to Microsoft to eventually provide one because I know they're working on a benchmark that showcases how faster this is. But what I want to show you is how the code of using something like this is actually changing. Because if I just, again, build this and I go to the IL code, so the lowered code of C sharp, what you're going to see is that it looks quite different. Now we have a lock.scope object, which by the way, you can access directly. You don't have to use um, the lock class. You can say scope and it is here. So you can create your own scope and that could be just padlock.enter scope. So you have access to all that and this can be disposed. You can say using a scope, but that gets a bit too advanced. So we're gonna just leave it out and go back to the IL and show you that now we get the enter scope call and that grabs a scope. We still convert lock to a try finally block, but in the end, all we're really doing is we're just disposing and dispose on the scope as we're going to see over here. Let's go back into looking into the scope class, or actually it's a ref struct, which is what makes it performant. You said we have information about the lock and the thread ID, but in dispose, eventually we just exit the lock, we just go out of it. And this is code you could also write manually. You, nothing stops you from saying scope equals padlock dot enter scope, grab that scope, and then of course we don't need that. Have it right finally and eventually scope dot uh, dispose. Or you could also have the padlock itself and you can say padlock dot enter or try enter, completely up to you. And then after the operation, you can have an exit if you do something like that. And I'm not saying you should do this because you really shouldn't. But if you do something like that, this also locks it. Now, you could also use something like the try enter method, which gives you an option to provide milliseconds and time span. And that represents the timeout. So if you grab a lock for more than a second, for example, then automatically exit the lock to prevent potential deadlocks. So there's plenty of flexibility in using something like this, but the default behavior, which is what Microsoft tried to provide, basically you have old lock code, you can very easily turn it into new lock code. So you have that option, but it also gives you the option to control everything about the padlock and say that this lock object has more information about the lock itself. You can enter, exit, enter a scope, and you can check what thread is currently, or if a thread is currently holding that lock. So moving forward, that's how you should be locking your code. Now, I do want to point out that if you had something like a, a task method over here and not just a void, then if you had something like await uh, task dot delay for a second, you still can't use await or actually have to turn this into async, but you still can't use await inside a lock statement. You would still have to use something like a semaphore slim that can only allow one thread to come in here. And then you would have to say, let's just comment that one out. You'd have to say uh, that you want to wait async and that will grab a thread safe asynchronous lock and um, then wait for a second. And then you have to, of course, release it. So release that would provide an asynchronous ability to lock. However, this goes beyond the lock object scope, so I'm not going to touch on that. And I'm curious to see if Microsoft will ever do something about this, like supporting uh, the lock object on an async level. It would be nice to just consolidate that behavior. But until then, all you need to know is moving forward from .NET 9 onwards, you should be using a lock object, not just any reference type object. Use a specific type and you're going to start seeing it more and more and you're going to get a minor performance boost 
which is very tricky to measure. But now I want to know from you, what do you think about this object? And have you ever used a third party library to do async locking? I know I have, so I'm very curious to know which one you have been using. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding.